Uh, thank you very much, Miles. Um, it's an honor to speak at Annapolis, the United States Naval Academy, and especially the day after Veterans Day, uh, because you're all in the military and you protect our country, and I respect you. Um, so I, I do a lot of uh, blog work. I spend a lot of my time writing blogs for something called uh, Language Log. And uh, this is probably the most influential linguistics blog in the world. It comes from Penn, but there are a lot of people from other universities that write for it. And um, every day, 20 or 30,000 people read that blog. And they're very sharp. So when I write a blog for language log, I have to be very careful, because if I make one tiny little error, they're going to catch it. And they're going to make me feel awful. They'll rub my face in my error. So I, I, I spend a lot of time uh, being very meticulous in the way I write those blogs. And before I go further, I want to ask uh, how many people, and so I know whom I'm talking to, how many people here know anything about the Chinese language or know a little bit of Chinese? Hold up your hand. Oh, so a lot of you are taking Chinese language classes. That's good, because I'm going to be talking about Chinese language issues. And uh, it'll be a lot easier for me to explain things if I assume that you, if I know that you are aware of some of the basic issues and problems uh, re regarding Chinese language. Now, I make a big distinction between uh, script and speech, spoken language and writing. And in the Chinese case, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, there's rather a bit of a gulf, a gap between the writing and the speaking. So um, because the, the written language is not uh, phonetic, it's only partially phonetic. So it's not like the kana of Japanese, which is a syllabary. That's purely phonetic. But uh, the Chinese writing system is what we would call morphosyllabic. It conveys both meaning, morpho has to do with meaning, and syllabic having to do with sound. So each of those symbols conveys sound and meaning. Uh, so, it does, and, but without con conveying either of them perfectly or fully. So if you know the phonetic part of a Chinese character, you can sort of guess what the sound might be, but you won't know exactly what the sound is of that character unless you memorize it. Similarly, you may know that a Chinese character has a wood radical. Uh, you know, when you analyze the structure of the character, you say, oh, it has a wood radical. It probably has something to do with wood. But that doesn't help very much because a lot of things have to do with wood. Uh, so it's not very specific, right? <laughs> so you have a combination of sound and meaning in each of these symbols. Uh, and so when you're dealing with Cantonese, for example, or Taiwanese or Shanghainese, there are a lot of morphemes for which there are no characters. And it's very kind of odd that it just happens to be the most frequent morphemes often that don't have any characters. Uh, for example, the most frequent morpheme in Taiwanese is e. And that is the genitive particle, possessive particle. It's by far the most frequent morpheme in Taiwanese, but there's no character for which to write it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a blackboard man, but sorry. Uh, so they, 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 uh, the way, if you want to write uh, this most frequent morpheme in Taiwanese, you have to borrow something else. So they might borrow the Japanese kana pronounced no which in Japanese is the genitive signifier. But they wouldn't pronounce it that way in Taiwanese. They would still say eh, if you follow me. Or they might even borrow the English letter, e. So you will see Taiwanese text with the e in it, or the Japanese kana, no. And this is for this most um, frequent morpheme in Taiwanese. And the same is even true of Pekingese where there are a lot of things in spoken Pekingese that you cannot find a character for. This seems mind-boggling since Pekingese 
Beijing Hua is supposedly, it is by, by law even, the, the basis for Putonghua. Uh, but there are a lot of things in spoken Pekingese that you cannot write with characters because the, the morphemes don't match. Um, so Chinese writing is very special, very different. It's, it's more like Sumerian or Akkadian or an Egyptian than any other writing system that's around today, like uh, syllabaries or alphabets. There are a lot, and there are many different kinds. But Chinese is in a world of its own in terms of living scripts. But you know, the Chinese people, the Chinese economy, Chinese science, everything is progressing globally. So uh, sometimes there's a mismatch between this very ancient archaic script and a rapidly progressing <coughs> Chinese nation. So uh, these are some of the issues that I talk about in my blogs. And I have a, a class at Penn. It's one of my favorite classes, maybe my favorite class. I have a lot of favorite classes at Penn. They're all very different. One of my favorite classes is classical Chinese, which is very old fashioned. It's a dead, 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 dead language, but it's stimulating to the mind. But I have this class called Language, Script, and Society in China. So I spend a whole semester uh, talking about the issues that I'm going to talk about with you in 30 minutes. Uh, so it's going to be lickety split and uh, kind of rushing and summarizing. But I want to cover a wide range of issues relating to um, you could say the accommodation of Chinese language and script to the modern world. And what could be more modern than when it comes to language issues than the internet? So um, there are a lot of things that we find out about Chinese language um, and script through the way they're being manifested in developments on the internet. And I'm going to go through a few of these now. Let me see. OK, good. Yeah, this is, this is what a blog of mine would look like. On lang you can see it says language log up there. And then there are a list of authors. And I'm way down here. It's Victor Mayer, because V comes at the bottom of the first names. Uh, so these are all my colleagues who write for language log. And in this, this is one of my famous posts. I've written hundreds of posts for this language log. And um, because this term that I invented, character amnesia, has now become well known throughout the world. Um, I've invented a couple terms and uh, words, and some of them even get in the American Heritage Dictionary. Um, I'll talk about this. In, very, in detail in a moment. But there's another word that I invented, uh, and that is topolect. Um, you may not have heard of it yet, but you will someday. Uh, it's the, what I say is a precise, accurate translation of the Chinese word fang yan, fang yan, which is usually translated as dialect. It's been translated that way for a, a century, but it's a mistranslation. Even though everybody in the world translates Fang Yan as dialect, it's wrong. Because dialect implies like mutual intelligibility, but with just a different accent or different stress patterns and so forth. But um, these things in China that are called Fang Yan, a lot of times they're mutually unintelligible. That people speaking this Fang Yan and speaking that Fang Yan cannot have a conversation. That's like Cantonese and Beijing, Pekingese, or uh, Taiwanese and Shanghainese. They're different languages. But because this gets into a political problem, if, I can tell you uh, there are certain Chinese, if you say Taiwanese is a separate language, they might hit you. Uh, it's a volatile issue because they think language and politics and culture are all mixed up, intermingled. So I did have a, a very dear friend of mine from China. Uh, I was driving him up to Cornell once for a lecture. He was a very distinguished Chinese scholar, elderly man. 
and I was driving him up, you know, to go to, from Philadelphia to Cornell, you go through cornfields and cow pastures. And, uh, so along the way, I was talking about this. I said, you know, Taiwanese is not a dialect of anything. It's a language. And he got so angry at me. He wouldn't talk to me for two weeks. <laughs> and it was very uncomfortable being in that car with him <laughs> until we got to Cornell. And then he just wouldn't talk to me for weeks. Um, eventually, we made up. But I, it's so, so I wanted to defuse the politics. And that's why I invented that word topolect. And you guys all take a lot of math, I'm sure. You know, it's like uh, you're scientists, mathematicians. Um, so you all know what toponym is and top topology. It's a topolect is the speech form of a place. That's all it means. It's totally neutral. So you can say that safely, and no Chinese is going to beat you up if you say that Taiwanese is a topolect, because indeed, you're just simply very, very accurately and neutrally translating the Chinese word fang yan, and you're safe, and you're being true to science, linguistic science. So that, this is another term that I invented. Uh, uh, both of these words, we know character, we know amnesia, but I invented this phrase, uh, this expression. And it's, it's very long. I, and I, I, I don't even, all I have is this, the first page, the first screenshot. And what it, me, it, what it has to do with, it's di directly tied to computers. And most Chinese, <clears throat> Everybody is writing with computers in China the same way they do in America. And people forget how to write longhand in America, right? You, because it takes some kind of practice. But in China, they forget to write the characters. Because the computers are writing the characters for them. So n over 90% of Chinese, probably 95% of Chinese input characters into their computers phonetically with something called Han Yu Pinin, Roman letters. This is the official Chinese PRC orthography, Roman letter orthography for Chinese. It's official. It's on the law books. And they even have laws, rules, for how to divide up words. You know, normally Chinese is written without word breaks, right? It's just one character after another uh, without any spaces between words. But Han Yupinin, they have something called Han Yupinin Zheng Cifa. Zheng Cifa means orthography. And that tells you how to split up words in accordance with lexicon and grammar. So people are now using Han Yupinin to access their computers and to, to do everything on their computers, to write uh, messages, to do QQs, to do chats, to anything you do in your handheld device or on your computer involving language, it's now usually being done with romanization as the inputting system. And I have to also uh, emphasize that every single child in China who learns to read and write starts out with romanization. That's the way students learn characters through romanization. So everybody in China is exposed to romanization. They're familiar with it. And I d two days ago, I wrote a blog that was very widely discussed about um, President Xi Jinping visiting a school in Fuzhou. And a little girl less than eight years old wrote in her diary about the visit of the president of China to well, chairman, I guess you're supposed to say Zhu Xi. Uh, 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 chairman Xi. And she wrote this very cute, did you, any of you read it? Do you know about this? It became quite a sensational thing the last few days in the Chinese internet and the blogs and everything. And so I, my blog, I try to keep up with whatever's happening right now uh, with regarding Chinese language and script. So this little girl wrote this really, lovely kai little diary entry about the visit of the president, the, the chairman of Chinese Communist Party to her school. 
and she couldn't write a lot of the characters. She wanted to say all this neat stuff, but she knew what she wanted to say, but she didn't know the characters. So she used pinyin. And we have this very clearly documented, where it happened, who were her teacher, when it happened, so there's no question whatsoever that this, this really exists and we have the, the piece of paper with all this pinyin interspersed among the characters, you see. And what's amazing is that nobody is saying diu lian, like shame shame or xiu xiu. Nobody is saying she did something wrong. That, rather, they're praising her for saying she wrote this nice essay. Um, so you can see there's a kind of creeping in a romanization even to what people write. And I'm, in a moment, I'm going to give you a spectacular instance. Uh, I, the, this, I don't know if it's the next slide or the one right after that, but it's when I showed it in Vancouver where there are a lot of Chinese people uh, before an audience of several hundred people, the room just was full of a gasp. Everybody went, oh! I don't think it might not have that, it probably won't have that effect on you, but it did to a, a room full of Chinese. Vancouver has a lot of Chinese people. Um, so, Character amnesia is when, this is a phenomenon that has been going on for at least 15 years, when people really started to use characters, uh, computers a lot to write Chinese. And I know many of my Chinese friends, including like interpreters at the United Nations, who have been doing characters on computers for so long, they forget many of the basic simple characters. Because writing characters is neural muscular. You know, it's like playing a violin or something. Uh, you can't think about it. It has to be engraved in these neural pathways. Uh, that's why when you learn to write Chinese characters, you copy them hundreds of times. It's like you copy, uh, do arpeggios when you're playing the piano. You don't think about it. Your fingers just do it, <laughs> okay? And if the fingers can't do it, you can't really do those arpeggios well. Uh, so, because people are not writing characters by hand much anymore, they are forgetting basic, simple characters. And that's what I call character amnesia. And everybody admits that this is a, a phenomenon that's happening in Chinese, uh, in Chinese society now. So let me show you. I, I hope this is... The, well, I, this is just some... Uh, other posts I wrote about, like Character Amnesia Revisited. And then, uh, okay, I'll go over these briefly, each one. C spelling bees and Character Amnesia. Okay, the Chinese are very well aware of the spelling bee phenomenon in America. It's, you know, it's a, it's a big topic in America when we have our spelling bees, and especially since most of the winners are Indians. It's, there's something very unusual going on there, and I wrote about that. I wrote another blog about that. Why do the Indians always win the American spelling? And it cannot be by chance. It's so imiandao, you know, so overwhelming. Year after year after year, the Indians are winning. And if you want to know why, you have to read my blog. <laughs> it's too long to talk about today. So the Chinese are extremely concerned about the fact that here are these American kids who can spell all of these arcane, weird, long, rare words on TV, and, uh, and our students are forgetting how to write basic characters. So they say, we've got to stop this. And also, we're going to make a nice entertainment show out of it. So they invented, the, in China, the, the parallel to uh, the spelling bee. But in China, you cannot spell a character, can you? How can you stand up in front of an audience and spell a character? You'd have to say slanting stroke, vertical stroke, horizontal stroke, you know, like, fit, 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 and then you still wouldn't know what it does. Because there could be more than one character with that sequence of strokes. So they had to think of some other means to have a spelling bee in China, and it's the teachers here will know what I'm talking about. I, I think I see four teachers, perhaps. It's called Ting Xie. 
dictation. So the teacher says something, and you write it down. Okay, you hear something that's ting, and you share something that's the character you heard. That's sort of the equivalent of a spelling bee because it's very public, and they, you see the kid up there and trying to write these characters, and it's um, there's a lot of tension in the audience, just like at a spelling bee. Okay, uh, but it's not spelling really. But these became very popular in China a couple of years ago, and I wrote about them. Uh, there were shows, and it, it was a national hullabaloo, uh, these uh, sort of spelling bee competition. That's that. Uh, when, when am I, okay, when does this class end? Like 20 after? It's 20 after, yes. Okay, so I, I'm going to give 15 minutes questions Great. and answers. Um, 10 minutes will reply. Yeah, okay, 10 minutes, because I sure have a lot to say. Okay. Now, so what's happening, I call this the emergence of digraphia. Since people are forgetting how to write the characters in a lot of cases, and they're resorting to pinyin to fill in, it's sort of like Japanese kanji plus kana. A lot of, when Japanese don't know how to write kanji, they'll stick in kana, phonetic sounds. So pinyin is developing that way, and I call it the emergence of digraphia, because digraphia means uh, Parallel tracks of writing in the same society. In Chinese, the word would be shuang wen zhi, a system of two parallel, tra uh, parallel scripts. And it's, I call it emerging because no government is saying, you got to do this. Like in Turkey, Ataturk said, tomorrow you're going to stop writing Arabic and you're going to start writing with the Roman alphabet. Mark Reese knows that because he's a Turkish specialist. And so Ataturk said to the Turkish nation, I'm your leader. You start writing with the Roman alphabet. Nobody's going to do that in China. Mao Zedong almost did. <laughs> Mao Zedong came very, very close to doing that, but Stalin talked him out of it. Uh, so instead, he, they went the route of um, you know, simplified, simplified characters. They went the route of simplification, which we all know. In mainland China, they use simplified characters. In Taiwan, they still use traditional characters. That's a big s split on either side of the Taiwan Strait. OK, this is when the people in Vancouver gasped. They looked at this, and they just went, ah! Everybody's jaw dropped, because this is a Shopping list for dumpling ingredients. And what do you see? Uh, this is written, by the way, by a person with a PhD in China from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, wanting to go out and get ingredients for dumplings. Couldn't write the word for egg. You can say, uh. And you can tell that they're. They're actually literate because their characters are very well formed and grassy looking and natural. But these characters, they just forgot. And there's shrimp, which they used romanization for, pinyin. And jiu uh, cai, chives, Chinese chives. And you, they didn't get very far with that one. <laughs> You can see just a few strokes, and they were the wrong strokes. But this was a purely private document, but I got it out of the junk. And it's so precious because this is like what really happens in China. Nobody's covering up. This is really real <coughs> life that people are forgetting to, to write simple characters. OK, this is to go back to the uh, spelling bee. This is what it looks like. So out there would be a huge audience of people, and it's on TV, you know, CCTV 10. Um, and the, the moderator says, spell this word, Zuzhou. And uh, well, write, write it. And the, the student gets all tense, and they go up there. 
And they, well, if you keep writing all of them correctly, you win. But when you miss one, you're, you're out of it. You have to leave. So um, this is part of the reaction to the character amnesia phenomenon in China. This is a way to try to get students interested in writing correctly and working hard at it. Because the students who participate in these uh, events, these contests, uh, they have to give up a lot of their free time to prepare for these uh, spelling bees, these dict national dictation contests. How many of you do Tingxia here at uh, Annapolis? OK. You work hard? OK. <laughs> OK, this is another thing that happens on the Chinese internet. As you know, there's something called the Great Firewall. I suppose you know this. It's China's censorship mechanism. China censors the internet very heavily. And um, if the government doesn't like some word, they will outlaw it. And they will not let it pass around on the internet. They will just block it everywhere. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. This charming little creature is called a grass mud horse. That sounds kind of ridiculous, but it's very popular in China. Because if you say grass, mud, horse in Mandarin is cao ni ma. OK, grass, mud, horse. But it sounds like something very filthy, very bad. I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to translate it or interpret it for you. You can ask somebody else outside of class, like, what does it really mean? OK, and this, this is like somebody wants to ma, curse the president of China. And they'll say, grass mud horse, you president. And, but they're really saying something horrible. OK, so then you see the censors have to censor Grass mud horse, too. And another very famous one, you know, so it's like keeping one step ahead of the censors and being very creative in how you do it. Uh, so, you know, the net, they're called netizens in China, net, netizen, citizens of the net, the web. And they're like, what should I say, warriors for freedom. Um, and very inventive and very creative. So here's another famous one in China. Uh, Hu Jintao, the former chairman, uh, talked a lot about He Xie Shehui. OK? The harmonious society. I got, I, I'm getting too excited. So, <laughs> harmonious society. And, and all these netizens think, what kind of harmonious society do we have? And so they want to make fun of this Hu Jintao's harmonious society. So they say, river crab society, which is um, a homophone, a near homophone, OK? Because river crab and harmony sound similar in Chinese. And so they will talk about, say all sorts of things about the river crab. and. Uh, so you see they one step ahead of the censors. And then, here's the last one I'll tell you of that, that sort. Um, remember when the Arab nations were going through the Jasmine Revolution? The Jasmine Revolution starting in Libya, I think, uh, Tunisia, going across northern Africa. Well, you know, they're used to, one of the Hu Jintao's and Jiang Zemin's favorite songs was Mo Li Hua. You know, the jasmine flower. And people like to drink moli cha, you know, jasmine tea. Uh, so people would start to say, talk about jasmine in China. And the government didn't like it. So they actually outlawed the term jasmine on the internet uh, during the period of the African 
Arab revolutions. But I say, you know, the, the government will never, ever keep up with the citizens. The citizens are too smart and they're too inventive. Okay, that's just, um, exa I, I write about how Romanization is creeping into Chinese writing in such a way that you could say, it's, it's a fact that Romanization is a part of the Chinese writing system now. The most important, best Chinese dictionaries have a section in the back that is devoted to Chinese terms that either wholly or partly consist of Roman letters, like Shen Dai Han Yu In the back, it has a, a section for this. And Chinese people know, know what WTO is, just like that, WTO. Um, and so there are many, many examples of usage of Roman letters in Chinese writing now, and it, and it grows. And there are many, many instances of how pinyin is used how pinyin is used. I mean, you at Annapolis here will be particularly interested in learning that semaphore, do you guys still do semaphore? That's, no? Like, do you still use slide rules? Do you know what semaphore is? Flags. You're on ship, you know, and you, you, you spell out things with, you don't do that anymore? Not even as like Navy history? Well, in China, they, do, they use um, pinyin in their semaphore. And Chinese Braille also uses pinyin. So there are a lot of applications for romanization in China. And I'm an archaeologist too. One of the, the Professor Yu didn't mention that I also do a lot of archaeology. I worked on the mummies in Central Asia, if you know those mummies out in Central Asia, um, Bronze Age. And I, so I'm quite familiar with uh, archaeological usages in China. And every, for example, every ancient cemetery you go to in China, the archaeologists number the tombs in the cemetery with M plus like 179. M17, that means Mu. So they're using a Roman letter, okay? Mu is tomb, okay? Um, so this is what I call creeping Romanization, and it's been going on um, for a long time. You have to remember when Mao Zedong was at Yan'an, Professor Yu definitely knows a lot about Yan'an, uh, they had Roman, they had Latin letter newspapers at Yan'an. They had novels, they had short stories written totally with pinyin. Um, so it's been creeping along for, for quite a while. And there's a professor at uh, Carleton College named Mark Hansel, PhD from uh, Berkeley, who treats the Roman alphabet as part of the Chinese writing system. But then you see some people, here's another reaction to that, because some people say, okay, if we're having a problem with our writing system, we should reform it within the writing system itself. So some people, especially artists, very inventive modern artists will invent new radicals. For example, one guy invented a radical for pollution and a radical for corruption because he says we need these in our modern society. And then this just shows you how the Romanization is creeping in. This is an actual Chinese, um, like, high bao or something. And you can see there's so much uh, Romanization used right there. But the most important thing I want you to look at is this R, R, because that is a morpheme. A mor uh, you know, it's, it means someone who does. It's an agent. And it's, they're using it instead of they're using it as a kind of Chinese suffix, which is quite remarkable. And what I say, the thing I like to stress about all of this is that it's, it just happens naturally. No government official is saying, we have to do this stuff, or you cannot do this stuff. 
It just evolves naturally. Oh, that's the end of all my slides. Uh, but I'm, and I still have time for you to ask a bunch of questions. I'm very happy to entertain them. So fire away. Yeah, Mark. Uh, an avowed amateur on Chinese culture, um, but I read a lot about the graying of China, uh, the, ch the shifting demographics within China, uh, the elderly population, et cetera. Is this, these changes that you see on the net, are they generationally bound or? Definitely young people. This is 40 and under, 30 and under. Okay. Yeah, and um, they're not bound by the old strictures. And furthermore, they have not invested so much of their life into the old system. So they feel like they're freer to experiment. And, and they're not asking. See, the, the other day, I wrote a, a blog post about uh, that little girl's letter, you know, and somebody, one of these very critical commenters said, how come there isn't any moral panic about this? And I didn't really know what he was trying to say by moral panic. But what he was, then people explained to me, I discussed it with my class, and then he said, well, it's moral panic because this is an infringement on traditional Chinese culture, you know, to have this foreign script working its way in. Even a little girl does it. People ought to be outraged. But the whole point of my post was that people are not outraged, even older people. In fact, they praised the little girl. So I think it's, it's gone beyond the point of generational, and um, it's just getting out into society at large. And a lot of it has, you know, from time to time, there's another thing, like every time they have a big Congress meeting in Beijing, a meeting of the National Congress, Somebody will come out and say, we have to outlaw people using uh, foreign names for their kids, for example. This is wrong. We should not let people use foreign names. And, um, but it keeps coming up every time there's a National Congress because it's like a lightning rod issue. But then people just still do it. So every, I have so many students at Penn now who come from mainland China undergrads, master's students, PhD candidates. And I would say that 99% of them have an English name. And um, <laughs> there's one that I got this morning. Her name is Psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E. Another one is Apollo. So you get some real doozies. Uh, but they're charming, you see. I actually love them. Uh, but people, they all have their English name. But that really annoys uh, the conservatives. And we, we were talking at, over tea just a while ago about what's, con what's conservative and what's liberal in China is very, as Professor Yu says, it's like upside down. Conservative and liberal in China and America. Next question. Yeah. Yeah. What I think for the most of Chinese people, when they don't voice out their concern, maybe they consider the pinyin as their own language. Sure, that's a good because way. It's not Roman, it's not, it's their language. Well, see, we used to say Loma pinyin, yeah, but Roman spelling, but now they say Hanyu pinyin, which means so. Sinetic spelling. Fine. And so I, I think that's a very important point that, you know, it's now gotten to a stage that they don't think of it as alien. Right. And she made a very good point that, you know, it's now just, this is our stuff. This is our writing system. Why not? Because it's not just, you know, guess how many people use the Roman alphabet, your Latin alphabet? Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, Vietnam. It's just like all over the place. And so why not? Uzbekistan, I think. Yeah. My gosh. OK, even Uzbekistan. Well, they use the Roman letters instead of Arabic. Um, so 
It's, it belongs to whoever uses it. And you can, I can assure you, you know, the word for Roman letter writing in Vietnam, does anybody know? Huh? Quoc Nu. Quoc Nu. Yeah, Quoc Nu. He's a Southeast Asian specialist. Quoc Nu. It, it's like Guo Yu. It means the national, well, language, but there is the national script. Quoc Nu. And Quoc means our country. And they don't think of it as foreign or from somewhere else. It's just, but you know, you have to believe. We're like, where did the alphabet come from anyway? Who, you know, who really invented the alphabet? You must know, somebody in this room. Phoenicians. Yeah, there you go, Phoenicians. If I were at Penn, I would throw you a candy from my pocket. <laughs> I keep candy in my pocket for the good students. <laughs> Snickers bars. Um, but you got gum in your mouth anyway, so. <laughs> that's okay. Hey, you're content, you're content. Um, but that's true, Phoenicians. Uh, but then, you know, the Phoenicians didn't quite invent the whole alphabet because it didn't have any vowels. It was what I call a consonantary. It, it, it just had consonants. But then it took the Greeks to add in the vowels. So you had a full alpha, alpha beta alphabet. Um, but it really goes back to the to Phoenicians. They're, they're northeastern Semitic people. And who were the Phoenicians? They were traders. And they were traveling all over, to, like up to Britain even, to get tin to make bronze. So the alphabet is a kind of script that is very, very functional and efficient. It's not meant to be pretty. It's meant to be like merchants would use, like for efficiency's sake. You know, a big, a big issue came up when language log just the other day. It's like it had to do with the, so many interesting things come up in the contents. Like the little girl wrote so many opinions, and then somebody said, "Hey, when I go to a Chinese restaurant, and I look at what the waiters are writing on the the bill, and it's full of all of these." extreme simplifications of Chinese characters that basically what they've done is just reduce Chinese writing to a syllabary. They're just writing down the phoneme, the phonophores. Uh, and it's, it's a widespread and natural phenomenon. The same thing happened in Japan. So how did the Japanese, you know, the most famous Japanese novel is Genji Monogatari, right? The Tale of Genji. That was written not in kanji, not in Chinese characters, but in uh, kana, the syllabary, way back over a thousand years ago. The syllabary, and it was called onna no moji, which means women's writing. And kanji was otoko no moji, which is man's writing, male writing. You can figure out why. Male writing is a lot harder. The guys wanted it to be as hard as possible. And, um, but how did kana come about? Kana came about by this extreme kind of simplification that resulted in phonophores, phonetics. Same thing happened to, um, the, you know, where the Phoenicians got the idea. Of, you can trace all of these back to earlier, you know, Akkadian, or uh, some people say Egyptian, there are some symbols, but they were kind of like Chinese characters, but the Phoenicians reduced them to phonetic components. So you, this is what I call the phoneticization of writing. And phoneticization is just like writing for dummies, but it works. Uh, writing for simplicity's sake and efficiency's sake. Okay, couple, couple more questions. Yeah, Miles. How much of this uh, uh, all have to do, uh, does have to do any, uh, with the fact that the, uh, the language of computer is English, and every keyboard made in China, used in China, is the same keyboard we use here? Not a lot. I'll tell you why. Because I, I have been following this 
computers and characters issue for 30 years when we first started to get computers in Chinese. And I had several big international conferences at Penn. And when the Chinese first came upon uh, characters and they wanted to put them in computers, they invented hundreds of different inputting systems. So there's no lack of ch Chinese style inputting system. In fact, we have them today. Changjie, Wubi. I mean, there's so many different character-based, shape-based inputting systems, but people aren't using them. That, so it doesn't really have to do with the fact that the keyboard is Western, because they're, they're Chinese-style keyboards. I still remember at Penn, you're like, we got some of these. Like, there was a CJK, Chinese, Japanese, Korean uh, keyboard. It had like this big. It was called large keyboard. It had only just Chinese components on it. OK, you guys. Are you, you're not. Are you brothers or twins or something? I can see it. OK. Professor, uh, you spoke earlier about uh, mainland China using simplified characters in Taiwan, Hong Kong. Using traditional? Or complicated, some people right. say. Yeah. As someone who grew up uh, learning traditional characters, I was curious uh, what the reaction of a conservative mainlander would be if I were to write in traditional Chinese. A conservative mainlander? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, they'd come up and hug you. <laughs> oh, really? They would love you. Okay. <laughs> if they're really conservative. Yeah. Or, uh, I, I guess, uh, someone you know, you guys are freaking me out. You look so much the same. Anyway. How about a liberal? Uh, a, a liberal <laughs> Chinese? <laughs> Uh, they, uh, they probably would say that's the uh, reactionary bandits kind of writing. Okay. Yeah, but if, if you, okay, so if you so meet party the, member. huh? Yeah. Party members, well, you don't do it in front of a party member, okay? <laughs> you had a question, brother. Um, yeah, so it was, it was similar to that. It would then be what's the next step with pinyin being used? Mm -hmm. And do you see tones falling with that? Oh, boy. <sighs> no, I mean, because you can mark the tones with pinion, right? right. The proper pinion has the tones marked with diacriticals, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can mark tones with numbers, too. Of course, you know there are four tones plus a neutral tone, right? right. So that neutral tone is no tone, absence of tone. Uh, but I have actually written, if you're really interested in this, I've written several language log articles about, and, and I'll help you find them if you send me an email, about when uh, intonate, like stress or melody or other factors override tones. And I've written about this. So, yeah, sometimes it happens, but I don't think the tones are going to go away. Because, okay, I published a Chinese journal, a Romanized Chinese journal, and at first we put in all the tones, and that was mafan, troublesome. And then we realized they didn't really need it, and so we started to publish, my wife and I did this for 10 years, we published a journal, Romanized Mandarin, with proper orthography, spaces between words, oh God, people are gonna go, and no tones. And guess what? People read it off, automatically inserted the tones. If they're, if they're native speakers. It's just like in Russian. Not all the stresses are marked. And not all the, the vowel changes, right? It's, you just write it this pared down way and people fill in the, blank. fill in the blanks. Yeah. OK. Um, unfortunately, we have to end the lecture here. So uh, this is a fascinating uh, uh, talk. And uh, please uh, join me uh, and give another round of applause.